Here to deliver our 2023 commencement address, I give you Dr. Angelis. President Corey, thank you for getting me back to Maine. On my mama's side, I'm the first son born outside the South. On my dad's side, I'm the first son born outside New England. When I leave here today, I'll head up to Thomaston to lay wreaths on the graves of my great-grandparents, my grandparents, and my great-uncle. You can say I was born on a bridge, a bridge between North and South, black and white, the old world of the East Coast and the cutting edge that is California. I lived my whole life on that bridge. I'm the first head of the Sierra Club, not just to be based on the East Coast, but south of the Mason-Dixon, leading an organization that was founded in San Francisco 130 years ago. And what life on that bridge has taught me is that no matter where we look, no matter what we look like, no matter how or when our family got here, we have far more in common than we don't. This year, hip hop turned 50, and so did I. <laughs> Throughout the last half century that has been my life, more often than not, it has felt like our nation, the world's greatest and wealthiest democracy, is in decline. Traditional middle and working class dreams of being able not just to afford a home, but to be able to afford a, a simple fishing boat or a sailing skiff or just a little cabin up in the woods seems to be long out of reach for most of us. And a once great industrial nation that won wars with our prowess, when facing COVID, man, we couldn't even make enough masks. We even ran out of toilet paper. When I was a kid, my father was proud to tell me that the first jealous came through Alice Island, an assistant mill manager, and went on to build textile mills throughout New England. America led the world in moving beyond the old by making stuff. You know the old sign when you come up on Amtrak, you pull into Trenton, it says, Trenton makes, the world takes. Every time I see that sign, I think, Trenton made, the world took. It's not just that my family doesn't operate mills anymore, it's that they pretty much don't operate in our country anymore. Thanks to NAFTA, a so-called free trade policy that gave so much wealth to the rich, but took the livelihoods, and if we're honest, the lives, of so many middle and working class people who made stuff. Some 63,000 factories have shut down in America in the last three decades. That's more than one factory closed for every town and city in our country. And what the social scientists tell us is that when the factory shuts down, drug addiction goes up. Town after town, city after city. Heroin, meth, pills, fentanyl. It's been a never-ending stream of suffering and death. Everywhere, every place there used to be a factory. Everywhere America used to bustle with industry. Everywhere American workers used to brim with pride from having made it, made it with their own hands, and made it well. And yet what we know deep in our souls is that America and Americans, we have overcome worse before. When you grow up in a family that on one side is defined by its participation in the revolution and on the other side by its participation in the cause for abolition and your parents met in the civil rights movement, you know that this is a country that has overcome monarchy and slavery and the very laws that made my parents' marriage illegal. In the dichotomy of the old America, whites and blacks were positioned as two poles, with the rainbow of humanity stratified in between Irish and Vietnamese, Latinos, Native Americans, buddy pegged to a different place. Growing up in a family with parents drawn from each of those poles, traveling back and forth between the West Coast and West Baltimore, between small town Maine and small town California, and later working as an organizer, involved in campaigns to better our country in every state in this country. You learn that when America acts on its best instincts, it frees everybody. Parents on love story is a testament to that. You, like me, are one of the lucky ones. You were able to go to college either because your family supported you or you decided to support yourself. Either way, 
You are graduating today. Again, let's hear it for our graduates. Congratulations, you have a great life in front of you. But you didn't just come here to better your lives for yourself, for your children. You came here to do more. You came here as part of a generation. And across every other graduation this spring, you're different. Your college stands out as having prepared every single student, not just to live a sustainable life, but to deliver a sustainable future. And in the process, help save the planet for humanity. And the good news is that in this moment, our Earthshot moment, this moment is also America's best shot at our own revival too. Today, as Americans, we can proudly say that we have the technology, we have the demand, we have the money, and we have the means to open thousands of new factories, create millions of jobs, good-paying jobs, family-sustaining jobs. The passage of the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Bill, and that sounds like a mouthful from a guy from Washington, but listen to me. It's the largest investment in rebuilding American manufacturing in our lifetimes. It offers us a game-changing opportunity. After all, it is designed to sustainably fuel new technologies. Everything from electric cars to batteries to solar panels to heat pumps. They will not just change our economy and the way we live, but get our neighbors back to work, creating good jobs for Americans, not just the ones who went to college, but those of us, our friends, our family, who could never find their way, never afford to get here. Let us also be clear that at this moment, our nation is finally again prioritizing businesses and products that are made in America. These new American technological innovations and resulting jobs to make and install these technologies will be local. And let's also be clear. We are in a global competition that we must win. The COVID pandemic laid bare the vulnerability of the global supply chain. It also laid bare the utter weakness of America's current supply chain. The way we fix that is simple. We throw everything we've got at rebuilding America's manufacturing prowess. We simply cannot be dependent on manufacturing parts in China. The good news is that we are finally on the verge of building a made in America economic revolution. This must be the formula for making the American dream real for all of us. It's the only one we got. If we lead the world in innovation and we lead the world in manufacturing, we will lead the world in job creation and we will lead the world in the elevation of wealth from the bottom up, not the top down. We must get America rising again. When I think of our nation at its best, I think of JFK's moonshot. And what I'm here to say to you, brothers and sisters, what you may not have realized is that these last few years, as you've been preparing to help deliver this generation's earth shot, you've also been preparing to deliver America's best shot at a real comeback. If you're wondering, well, given all of that, why aren't we moving forward faster? Follow the money. You can do that. In America, there's always a fight between the future and the status quo. And the stewards of the status quo always have more money to try to stop the future than the entrepreneurs and the innovators have to deliver it. If you're wondering who I'm talking about, ask yourself, who profits when America stays stuck on stupid? And you can do that, right? It's the big oil companies who don't want you to know that my all-electric F-150 costs a fraction to operate than the old gas one that I sold to buy. If you keep following the money, you run into utility companies that don't want anyone to know that we finally reached the place where purchasing solar energy, purchasing wind energy, purchasing renewable energy, renewable energy is now cheaper than energy coming from coal fire power plants. You know, the one that gave your cousin asthma. 
In other words, they're investing to maintain gridlock in Washington and rigging politics in state capitals so they can continue to profit even if it literally kills us. For decades, big oil has lied about the climate crisis while they spend billions upon billions to stifle change. Last year, BP's profits were 27 billion, Chevron's 36 billion, Shell's 40 billion, Exxon's 56 billion dollars. These corporations are simultaneously gouging working people at the pump, forcing us to pay sky-high prices while raking in those record profits. It's not right, and it's not sustainable for consumers, let alone planet Earth. Like our American civil rights workers of the 20th century, our abolitionists of the 19th century, and our American revolutionaries of the 18th century, we find ourselves outnumbered, outgunned, at a time and place when we know we must rise to overcome this moment. In such moments, I often go back to the wisdom of Frederick Douglass, who in the wake of the Civil War insisted that good would ultimately triumph over evil again. He said it was America's destiny. Specifically, he reasoned that every nation has a character, that, that nation's character is defined as that nation at its best, not its worst. That every nation's character is ultimately shaped by its geography. And he reasoned that we, bordered by great nations north and south, defined by people of different hues, and great oceans east and west that connect us to every people on the planet, that our destiny as America was to be, quote, the most perfect example of the unity and dignity of the human family that the world has ever seen. In other words, brothers and sisters, we must win, we can win, and we will win this fight too. We will deliver a better future the way we always have by coming together more boldly, faster than most think is possible. And when we do that, this nation, this nation that came together to overcome kings, this nation that came together to overcome slavery, this nation that came together to end segregation, this nation is coming together again to save humanity, to lead the world in saving humanity itself. This is what you have been training for. This is what you came here for. This is the mission of your generation unless you're feeling alone with all that pressure. Just take a moment and look around. Look at your friends, your family, your kids, and recognize you have backup. We're all in this together. In this fight, we are already coming together to win. And in America, when we come together, it means that we will win. And so I ask all of you to do what I was trained to do as a kid growing up in the black church. Claim the victory in advance and go make it real. May God bless you. May God bless Unity College. May God bless Unity Environmental University next year. And may God bless all of us. Thank you.